Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Fear Group podcast, Empowering Plans with the Fear Group. I am your host, Adam Russo, and uh, we're excited to be here today. It's beautiful outside, huh, Ron? It is a disaster out there. I what mean, is it? Uh, Nor'easter times, too. My, fr- my, my kids have worn rain boots, it seems like, for a week straight now. It's been a bit gusty and a bit wet. So, folks, we're so happy to have record attendance again. Uh, it just seems like more and more people, for whatever reason, like to hear the sound of Brady, John, Ron, and myself's voice. So it's great to be here. I'm sure we'd have even more people if Jen McCormick wasn't on maternity. Yeah, I think the ones we do have, we're actually looking for Erin, but she's one and done. Erin is not coming back ever. <laughs> Jen McCormick may be coming back. We're not positive. Um, I guess the second child isn't as easygoing as the first one, according to her. So that means she's like a real parent now. She has to stay up at night and she all that. She got overconfident. She got too confident with the first one. So, folks, we know that it's renewal time. We know that you're busy, so we're going to do what we can to speed through this. As always, we try to make this entertaining and educational. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in. As we go through those questions, anything that we think is relevant to the topic that we're discussing, we'll obviously bring it up. But what I want to make sure everyone knows is a two-part webinar. Ron? I believe it's the first of its kind. In the 10 years we've been doing this, it is the first time we've ever had a two-part series. Remember those TV shows back in the 80s? Oh, yeah. It was always like two be continued, continued. like uh-huh. growing pains. Yeah. Like, they don't do that anymore. No. They actually did a uh, two-part planned document webinar. All right, why do you have to ruin this? Sorry. I totally forgot about that. Okay, so I guess we have done it before, Rob. I'm the fact yeah. checker. We have never done a what to expect in 2019 webinar. No, it's actually. the first of its kind. That is the first that. of its kind. So, we're really excited about this. Folks, I'm also really excited because I won the football pool again this week. I know. I mean, all I do is bet the Browns and bet against the Patriots. And anytime those two things happen, I win the pool. That's true. And it happened again. You're so it's going against the current. Anyways, yeah. this is who's with us here today. Woo. It's myself. And I'm going to introduce the rest of you folks. Obviously, our singing VP, General Consul, say hello, Ron. Hello, Ron. In addition, we have John Jablon, who's wearing his favorite Buffalo Sabres jersey today. Not really wearing the appropriate attire to be at work, but that's okay. John, our Director of Provider Relations, say hello, John. Good afternoon. And last but not least, our political insider, our expert, live from D.C., from the Capitol, right now, he's dialed in. Say hello to Brady Bizarro. Say hello, Brady. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. The satellite is working, Brady. We can hear you here. Folks, as always, please feel free to follow us on LinkedIn. We have thousands of followers. Matt did a great job getting us these followers. The hashtag Save Matt, Save Matt's job worked. He's still here, but please continue to follow us. We have some really cool stories that we put on there. In addition, want to make sure that we let people know, Level 3 certification is ready to launch. Ron, how many people are we going to require or ask nicely to take FIA certification Level 3? Yeah, so we've got only a handful right now, Adam, only the, the five people, but... You know, depending on how many of them survive the experience, we may invite some actually valuable employees to try. But the guinea pigs are being limited to the five we can sacrifice. So, folks, what's going to happen on Level 3 certification? You'll be, they'll be locked in a room. There will be a room where they cannot leave. Ron and myself will do four hours of pure grilling, oral exam, no multiple choice. And after that four hours, if they're still standing, if they're still breathing... They get certified. Yeah, it's basically the subrogation version. Of we thought. should actually do a webcam. We should do a webcast of FIA certification level three, like, exams taking place. Yeah, it's like a I game think, show. I think people would watch that. They can phone people for help, but they only get one per game. I work. Yeah, we can do it. So I want to make sure we do a special shout out to Camille Vasca of HMA, avid fan of our webinars and podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. We will make sure, just so you know, we are ordering some new goodie goodie bag stuff. We got a bunch of new FIA group products coming in for 2019. We're really excited. Matt did a great job. We will be compiling all those great things, Camille, and sending them out your way. So thanks again for dialing in. We're happy that hopefully you're here now. Hopefully all your friends that are working, all your coworkers are cheering you along as we keep on saying your name. So special shout out to you, Camille. Thanks again. In addition, want to make sure people know, please subscribe with iTunes. Check out our podcast. Why? Our podcasts are freaking awesome. Yeah, they've been getting really good, too. We've been trying all sorts of different things. Uh, Faces of Fia. So this is a new thing we're doing now is the Faces of Fia. We started this program a couple weeks ago with Matt being our first one. I think he just self-imposed himself on that. We didn't really want to have him as the first face. We did want these two faces, Amanda Lima and Norma Phillips. Uh, I think Norma's podcast will be 
next week. Yep. You'll be here, be able to hear the interview with her. Norma is part of our Future Leaders program, as you can tell. Norma is an amazing, amazing employee, probably the backbone of our, oh, our entire organization. In addition, Amanda Lima, who is smiling there. Folks, Amanda used to be my full-time assistant, and she's still smiling. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Well, she's like she's not your assistant anymore. That actually. could be part of the reason. We'll be posting Amanda's in a few weeks, so we're really excited to have these two great people who are really the cornerstone of our organization. We want to make sure we share these fine folks with you. So really quick, folks, we need some feedback. We promise this won't be long. How long is this, guys? It's about two minutes. Yeah. We just want your feedback, and this is our next video that we're doing. This relates to our plan document management software. Again, instead of having Garrick or Gambit or Tim or Ron or myself bore to death with these uh, web with, with with these um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, tutorials. Tutorials. Perfect. We figured instead, let's just do an animated video and make you watch it. Who doesn't love a cartoon? Right. So we'll start it right now. It'll be two minutes long, and then we promise we'll get this thing going. Media document management or PDM is an online plan drafting and document management tool designed with compliance and efficiency in mind with regards to all plan drafting needs. Using a comprehensive checklist to template methodology. PDM takes the work out of additional manual processes, allowing for quicker completion of plan documents. Coupled with attorney oversight, you can draft confidently and worry-free, knowing the documents are compliant, no matter how the industry changes. Fear Group understands that no two self-funded plans are the same. To that end, the checklist is built with variability in mind. With hundreds of options built into the system, the checklist will change in real time, adding or eliminating questions as you go. Have unique business needs? PDM can be customized to suit any organization as opposed to having organizations conform to one approach. Everything from the checklist to the document can be tailored to incorporate custom verbiage designed by the client for the client. Whether you use the FIA Group's best-in-class plan document language or your own template, the FIA Group's team of attorneys will provide monthly newsletters to PDM subscribers packed with a myriad of industry trends, regulatory news, plan drafting considerations, and more. FIA Document Management. It's just another way the fear group continues its mission of empowering plans. So that was pretty good. I think it's, I think it's Tucson's voice there. We really want your feedback, if at all possible, folks. Let us know what you think. I think the music in the background on that, Ron, was a little weak. It's pretty pretty chill. I mean, I'm starting to get a little... I think it's out, a little yeah. too fall asleepish for me. I mean, Until plan it, documents are exciting. We need some... You know, know, Tucson could be a little bit more passionate in his, <laughs> his uh, delivery as well. I think we have to, that's my personal opinion, and it sort of matters. I am the boss here, so that's my two cents. Folks, in addition, we have the SIA Future Leaders Forum. Hey, Brady, how many people at FIA we have going to this? We have, I think, four. There's four people going from FIA uh, down in Tampa on December 12th and 13th. Probably a nice time to go down to Tampa. So we're excited about that. We're trying to get, folks, as many of you that possibly can come. Registration fees are low. It's a pure networking event for the younger future leaders of our industry, and as the next chairman of SAI, I really hope and urge many of you to join along if you possibly can. All right, we're finally getting to the good stuff. What is the overview? Problem, purpose, people. Last month, PGC, most frequently asked questions, and of course, we're gonna have Ron talk about the midterm elections, not Brady, we're gonna, we're gonna switch that yeah, up. All right. We're gonna have John talk about the future of the ACA, not Brady. We're gonna talk about association health plans, the wellness program incentive rules, health savings accounts, employer mandated paid family and medical leave, TPA service offerings, plan design incentives, and none of you guys will understand what this is about. The master's degree? What does that have to do with anything? And maybe after all that, we'll let Brady talk for a few minutes. So with that, I'm going to turn this right over to John Jablon and talk about last month's frequently, most frequently asked questions from the PGC referral team at FIA. John? Thanks, Adam. Uh, as you viewers know, we get tons and tons of questions. So many questions. And every month, we pick out a few that are frequent and that come up more often than others. And one of them this month is, are executive benefit plans permissible? Executive benefit plans are exactly what they sound like. For those of you who don't know, it's basically a, a benefit or set of benefits offered exclusively to executives at a given employer company. So the short answer is yes, they are permissible. The HIPAA and ERISA rules allow you to differentiate in benefits based on bona fide employment-based classifications. And one of those is the status of the employees. And one of those statuses is executives. Absolutely. But 
but be very mindful of the rules governing highly compensated individuals, or HCIs as we like to call them. Executive benefit plans are perfectly fine according to the regulations, but the practical effects of those benefit plans may be problematic because executives, more often than not, are some of the most highly compensated individuals at a company. So keep in mind the dollars when you're looking at the benefits because, again, the short answer, yes, they're fine. You can do whatever you want in terms of differenti uh, differentiating benefits as long as it's based on a bona fide employment-based classification, but if the executive benefit plans cater to highly compensated employees, you may well have a problem. Second question here, do the mental health parity rules require employers to cover mental health and substance abuse benefits? Short answer, no, they do not. What they do, however, is require employers to cover mental health and substance abuse claims at substantially the same levels as medical and surgical benefits. So you don't have to cover mental health and substance abuse claims, but if you do, there are certain regulations that apply, and of course, if you have any questions about any of these, feel free to email pgcreferral at viagroup.com. Right there on the bottom in the middle of the slide, pgcreferral at viagroup.com. I feel like a radio advertisement right now. But last question here. What are the implications of prohibiting assignment of benefits? This is Do not a talk about assignment of benefits. <laughs> Only Ron Peck is allowed to talk about assignment of benefits. Say what's happening Everyone here. here knows that. Yeah. So okay. really quick on this question. Uh, Assignment of benefits is a funny thing, and, and some of you may know that this is one of Ron's favorite topics. Well, funny, I take it seriously. It's very funny. It's funny how seriously you take it. <laughs> but uh, assignment of benefits gets very, very relevant to reference-based pricing, and a lot of health plans are of the opinion that if they prohibit assignment of benefits, it will help with reference-based pricing. In some cases, that is absolutely the case, but keep in mind that prohibiting all assignment of benefits means that medical providers are never getting paid directly. It is a huge burden on the TPA, and if it's one that you want to undertake, by all means... Well, why do you say it's a burden on the TPA? At the end of the day, it's really a burden on the facilities, right? So we all know right now, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina is doing their own RVP program, where they are calling it, uh, it's like, I forget, My Choice or something. And the way they're doing it, their program, is... They're reimbursing Medicare plus 140. They're paying the members the Medicare plus 140. So the balance bill is always going to go to the patient. And Blue Cross say, we're going to pay the patient the Medicare plus 140, give them whatever you want, but it's now between, entirely between the member and the facility. They have literally not only revoked the time of benefits, it doesn't exist. Like, we're just going to pay the members every time. Right. So I'm I'm a little on the spot, but I, I don't know why you're talking about it. It's funny. It's funny you bring up uh, you're not on the North, spot. You bring up North Carolina, Adam, because actually it was many many years ago. One of the uh, hallmark assignment of benefits lawsuits that we've used to justify different arguments over uh, either revoking or prohibiting assignment of benefits in the first place is actually the Oceana case, which I believe actually was in North Carolina. Again, like I said, I'm, I'm on the side. It was either North or South Carolina. I apologize. But, um, and that was, I think, actually a case that involved uh, Blue Cross as well back then. And that was a situation where, again, the payer wanted to prohibit assignment of benefits the plan document or policy uh, specifically prohibited assignment of benefits. And when the hospital sued the plan to be paid directly, that prohibition on assignment of benefits was upheld by the court. So even then, that kind of laid the groundwork for using assignment of benefits as a carrot and a stick. Um, you know, certainly you can write outright do what Adam just described and prohibit assignment of benefits right off the top, and it's the patient's problem. At the same time, I think you can use assignment of benefits as either a threat or a benefit, meaning if a provider is willing to work with the plan, you allow assignment of benefits to that provider, and if a provider is not willing to work with you, you revoke assignment of benefits in that case. But I think that assignment of benefits is something that's extremely valuable, and for that reason, I think it's uh, something that could be used as we look to negotiate with providers. We lost about 100 people because of Ron just started talking. That's because they're off changing their plans, taking my advice. All right, with that, we're going to turn it back. Live in D.C. Brady, can you hear us? I can hear you. All right, let's talk about the 2018 midterm elections. Folks, we're going to try to keep this short and sweet. Please, there's a lot to go over that's not, you know, we're not just talking about what's happening in Congress. We're going to talk about what's happening in the cell phone industry as well. 
So let's talk about how these two worlds collide. Ed Brady, take it from there. Thanks, Adam, from my perch here in the West Wing. But uh, look, the truth is a lot of what happens in, um, in Congress does matter for self-funded plans. Uh, these midterm elections were huge. Anyone who listened to the podcast Ron and I did on November 1st, I made some prognostications about what would happen. And I'm happy to report that, of course, I was right, that the uh, oh, of course. <laughs> the House turned blue, as we know. The Senate stayed red. Wow, you're um, amazing. No one else right. thought no that. No one saw that coming at all. <laughs> you were the only person. <laughs> But it wasn't a look. It wasn't a blue wave, but it also wasn't a blue trickle. It was something in between. I don't know what the word you want to put in there is, but these were consequential. Like a blue midterm. white cap? Is it a white? Was it a white cap? Blue ripple. A blue ripple. I like that one. We can go. With blue, blue ripple. ripple. Okay. But look, this this was an important midterm uh, for healthcare, for turnout, for spending. Um, the Democrats really picked up a lot of seats in the House. We'll talk about it in a second. We'll go over the balance of power, but. Look, I just want to just say that this was really one of the biggest midterms since 2010, um, which in political lifetimes is a long time. So what happened in, in the different chambers? And this matters for the future of, you know, health care legislation. So in the House, the Democrats picked up about 32 seats, probably will end up about 35 to 40. Still 10 races have not been called because they're literally still counting. Um, if not for gerrymandering, in fact, that the losses would have been a lot more for Republicans, but didn't, didn't happen, frankly. Um, as far as the speakership goes, though, and who will run the, the chamber, I think we're going to have Speaker Pelosi again. That's a big deal because she oversaw, of course, the administration of the Affordable Care Act when it passed in 2010. Um, she's still around now, even though a lot of people are calling for her to step aside. She's 78 years old, but she's got a lot of energy. I think she'll be the next speaker. Uh, in the Senate, just quickly, the losses look like they'd be pretty bad for the Democrats last week. Now, this week, with some races having been called, most notably um, in Arizona, the losses for the Democrats there might be limited to about one or two seats. There's a couple of issues happening in Florida, as normal, uh, with some recounts going on with the Senate race there. Looks like the Republican might eke it out in, in Florida. So when it's all said and done, I think the Democrats might eventually lose three to four seats in the Senate. Um, but a lot of recounts happening in contests that are still being decided in Georgia, in Mississippi, there'll, there'll be a runoff. So I'm following those. They're going to matter because in the Senate, the margins matter, right? Um, if Republicans have the votes they need uh, to force through either judicial nominations or other legislation and related to health care, every single vote is going to count. And going forward, though, I think what this midterm election has revealed, and, and Ron and I will be doing a more extensive podcast on this, um, on the results and what they mean for health care later this week. But what's going to happen, I think, for the Democratic Party is they're going to have a problem with rural America going forward in 2020. I think it's going to be harder for them to recapture the Senate because you've got these less populous states. Um, with two Senate votes, right? And Republicans sort of have a stranglehold on popularity in those states. And so it's going to be tough for the Democrats to recapture the Senate anytime soon. So uh, with, that say, what are, with that said, what are some takeaways for health care that we can tell from these elections? Well, it was on the ballot, and I think it won. 41% of voters said it was the vote, most important issue for them. Um, this is despite the you know, other issues about the immigration and the economy and taxes. This was the biggest issue. Um, voters were very, very concerned with protecting parts of the ACA that are, that are um, popular, that have been for years, um, protecting those that have existing conditions was popular. I think that's going to stay um, going forward. The Affordable Care Act for now is safe. Um, repeal and replace is probably dead because obviously without having the House of Representatives, you're going to have Republicans are not going to be able to pass um, a repeal and replace bill like they did a couple years ago in the House. Um, and then, of course, it failed in the Senate. But um, what else did we see? I think it was important to note that on, on the, the night of the election, after the Democrats took the House, uh, speak, Speaker-elect, if you will, Pelosi, made some important um, points in her speech. She talked twice about bringing down the cost of drugs, which, if you've been following the news and what we've been talking about for months now, um, is a topic that Republicans are very excited about. I think there's some bipartisan um, support on this issue. I think the tide is turning against manufacturers and maybe even, in some cases, PBMs. That'll be an issue that Republicans and Democrats can get together and work on. And she also used some phrases like, we're tired of division. We are one country. So I do think you're going to see some action on drug prices um, sometime soon. Um, also, notably on Medicaid, some red states here endorsed ballot initiatives, which will expand Medicaid access in those states. That's a big deal because that was always a part of the ACA that many Republican states refused to embrace. Um, and the governors of those states refused to embrace. Now you have the people of those states saying that, that they want Medicaid expanded. Uh, in certain well, that's cases. not really good for the private sector, right? It's not. No, I think this is again Medicaid a, expansion that means higher costs for a self-insured plan, right? Correct, and it also means that providers get reimbursed less, so they got to make up right. that losses in that market elsewhere. Right. 
So it's not necessarily good for our industry, and I'll talk about in a second as well uh, what happened with Medicare for All, which a lot of people ran uh, for Congress supporting that idea, which of course would be very bad for our industry as well. But those are the key takeaways for now. I want to focus on, if you don't mind, I know it's sure. on our next slide. Sure. This one here, I mean, I want to know how in the world did the voters not vote for this? How did this happen? Advertising. Yeah, I, I can tell you. So. What, what, what possible reason? Like, first off, why do most people even care about dialysis, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't affect most people. But secondly, you know, what do they do? To, how do they get people to vote? Brady, what was their the, favor? How much was spent? I, I know we had seen somewhere about the difference in how much was spent on this campaign, pro and against. Oh, yeah. So, well, the, I don't have the pro and against, but I have a total spending amount. And I can tell you it was $130 million. That was the most expensive ballot measure. $130 million country. was spent total. by the private, on, by DeVita and Fresenia? On both sides. But, uh, but uh, far far more was spent like by DeVita and Fresenia. 10 to 1, 10 to 1 yeah. ratio. I bet you $100 million of that was spent by, yeah. by the opposition to this. But I think it's important. Why would a patient advocate? Try to squash this. Well, I'll tell you. So the the the, can, the opponents. Can you just give us some background on this? Sure. How this yeah. happened? How this get? Because this one, to me, as you all know, if I ever get end stage renal disease, I won't have any treatment anywhere. Like these folks, these these facilities hate me. They, I think my name, I'm blackballed. But how this happened? What's where, how sure. this get on the ballot in the first place? So I'm glad you asked. And, and this is an example of um, really a number of health care issues that were on. Ballots were a big deal in this in this midterm election. California's Prop 8, I, I did some research on it. I, I expected you to ask about it. So what's going on is someone look, could research. California is one, is one of the biggest states, is the biggest state obviously in the country. And so therefore everything's big in California. Sorry, Texas. But in this case, they have 68,000 dialysis patients in California, 600 dialysis clinics. And you have the state's two largest dialysis businesses, DaVita and Fresenius, um, I think probably largest in the country. Right. Um, they're facing off here, or they were in this case, against one of the largest hospital workers unions in the, in the country. And so what's going on is you have um, dialysis prices are just so high right. that it's killing everyone, you know, from self-funded plans to right. insured to, to the government, frankly, the state there. Um, also, there's been a huge rise in complaints. Uh, the union says here that the clinic regulations of these clinics is so bad. Um, you have facilities that are plagued by rat and cockroach infestations. You have staffing shortages. There was even a case in the news, I think, a number of months ago, with a patient dying in one of the facilities that was left alone. You have no cleanup time, essentially, in between. Uh, so they're patients. saying not only these charges too high, but the facilities, facilities are, are garbage. Awful. Correct. And so that's really the genesis of this of this ballot measure. Um, and California also has other um, sort of nurse to patient ratio limits, which we'll talk about in, in Massachusetts, but they have other ballot initiatives that, that are related to this one. This one, though, was directly targeted at dialysis. It drew a ton of, of attention and it would a ton have, of money. It would have capped the amount that they can collect. Yes, it would have capped the amount that these businesses could collect at 115% of the cost of direct patient care, which means they could only collect money for salaries and wages of non-managerial staff who actually furnish care to patients, the people who actually... You so know, this, this, is a less, this is a reimbursement that would be re less than Medicare? Effectively, yeah. yeah. Potentially, yeah. Or what, how would they define cost? But effectively, any amount over 115% would have to be returned to either the health plan or the insurer or the actual patient, depending on who paid. So the payer, wow. who pays the plan. So that would have been a big deal. How uh, close was this one? Do we know? It wasn't. So I got it. 61 said no. 38 said yes. So it was kind this of. This was a blowout. Uh, kind of a yeah. blowout. And, and the reason, by the way, that it's many. Like a Republican of Massachusetts. Many people think that this is because um, the spending on the other side against was just huge. It was just yeah. crazy. These I also think maybe the out. reimbursement level was a little low. They probably could have did a better job. I mean, when right. in reality, our clients are reimbursing these facilities 4 to 500 percent above Medicare. To ask that this be 115% above the cost of the actual employees doing the work, that's actually less than Medicare. So I think that could be part of the problem. You raise a good point, Adam. And I think in, on the next slide, you'll see here when we talk about um, a few other notable results. I think the reason the California bill failed, and so obviously spending, I think, was one contributor. But also, you said you think it was the wrong number, the wrong, right. the wrong fix for the problem, right? I right. think the same thing happened in Massachusetts. Massachusetts had a very, very... Uh, important ballot measure that was yep. highly contested. Was it was big, and, and it, what it essentially would have done was imposed nurse-to-patient ratio limits uh, for nurses who work in hospitals, with some exceptions for public, public health emergencies, obviously. But currently, I, mean, I didn't know this until I looked it up, but our state only has ratio limits 
for intensive care units, but not for ERs, surgical units, maternity wards, things like that. And so what you had was you had uh, one side saying, look, that nurses are overworked, patient care is going down, uh, we need these, we need these uh, staff, staffing ratio limits to help nurses. And the opponents said the same thing that the opponents of California's Proposition 8 said. They said, patients will go without care, people will die, you know, if we have these arbitrary limits. And so that measure was also defeated really in flames. 70% said no to ratios on nurse to patient uh, limits and 30% right. said yes. So in for comparison, only $37 million was spent on this one. So California's was a lot bigger, but- and That's all that was spent here in our state. It's not like I saw commercial on this all the time. You, you did, but sure. just the cost, I mean, this is far less than in California. It makes you realize what they spent in California on the dialysis question. Right. But in both cases, you, ha you had states that are trying to address perceived problems in, in, in care or the price of care. And the opponents sort of being hysterical, saying, "Look, this is going to people are going to die. This is going to be a big deal. Uh, we'll have to close hospitals and clinics. We'll have to close." And I think I I, 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 I secretly believe that hospitals wanted this to pass so they can actually just charge more money. You know, it's funny because and Brady, to your you point, a reason. Hey, we need to hire more nurses. We got to increase the charge. Well, yeah, and that you know, I think a lot of the opposition to Proposition 1, to Question 1 in, in Massachusetts, that was an argument that they were making, is that if you force hospitals to hire more nurses, they're going to increase the cost, and you're going right. to have to pay eventually. It's not a freebie. So what's this Maine one that we got going on here? So, yeah, Maine was interesting. I thought it was worth just briefly mentioning that Maine has the highest percent of elderly residents in the nation, and it does. It does. Yeah, it's an old state. Uh, that's what I read, so I, I believe that people move there because, you know, the wilderness, I guess, wilderness therapy. So they die in the woods? Is that what you're trying to well, they're, they're not getting old people to go out on ice Maine. Yeah. Just to make sure he died. <laughs> old people move to Maine to die because there's wilderness. Well, look, that's what's happening. So they just want to like walk into the like the woods and just disappear into the mist. It's a problem that every state is what facing. Is but what kind of answer was that? <laughs> that's insanity. insanity. So, okay. so look, so what's happening is you have people who are uh, they're. They're getting older. They need more care at home. If they can stay in their home, they'd like to. And it's super expensive. Then why would it be rejected if care. all the old people who live there, they're the ones who because, go to the Because, again, home. another reason why. So it would have been financed, paid for by a 3.8% tax. People thought that was too high. They thought there was a better way of doing it. But There was a better way. Take them all, yeah. get them on a bus, put them up there, and just let them out in the woods. <laughs> they they, the they could have tried it. that, but, but, they, Elder, but, but look, voters Elder rejected it. Please. It was a closer, closer call. Frankly, but um, interesting, I, th I think you'll see similar ballot measures, though, in the future, because every state is going to have this problem where you have people who want to stay in their homes, who, who need um, home care, and it's so expensive. In Maine, it costs $60,000 a year for home care. I wonder if the assisted living facilities fought against this. I'm assuming they did, yeah. right? Sure. Yes, because they, they want, want people there. there. They want people they, there. They so you know what's really interesting that I'm seeing? And, and each of these questions, they're a little bit different as far as a vote yes would hurt the hospital versus a vote yes would help the hospital or contain costs or not contain costs or sort of a direct attack on what you're charging versus, you know, what they have to provide. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what every single question ended up deciding, and correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like the voters, the vast majority of voters basically said, we don't want anyone to tell medical service providers what to do, and we don't want to pay anything more out of our own pocket for health care. Right, which in my mind, those two things kind of contradict, right? Where it's let the hospitals charge whatever they want, don't tell them how to run their business, but I don't want to pay more for healthcare. Where do you think the money's coming from? That disconnect, and I think lack of understanding, was very much reflected by these uh, by these uh, questions. They were around, and we can go more in more detail on the podcast we have coming up. So what's but, going on with Kavanaugh now that so, he's in, right? I mean, that feels like it was like years ago. It does, yeah. Doesn't it? Like the whole scandal? It does. Well, he's, he's tried to stay under the radar. He has been seated. He's already weighed in on a few cases, actually. But again, this is about the future of the ACA, a problem that's going to drag into next year and beyond. We said that, and I think it's true, that it's safe from repeal for now, but the, the, real, the real vulnerability now is chipping away at the ACA. You have this ongoing case in Texas, which is still moving along here, where a challenge to the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act has been made by many states' attorneys general. Um, now that the individual mandate has been repealed, they're saying that the rest of the law cannot be saved. It's this principle called severability. Right, simple. Because you're the prognosticator. Sure. What's, you're the future, the futurist, right? I'm going to call you a futurist, okay? Sure. What's going to happen next year as it relates to the ACA oh, now that right. Kavanaugh's on the bench? Anything yeah, so, major? Yeah, or I do. Are think, people who are listening in need to know? Do they, do they make big changes? Are we good for now? What's the story? So here's what I think is going to happen, and, and I hope, well, well, we'll see if I'm right. But this Texas case is going to go to the Supreme Court, is, is my view. And what's interesting is four of the, judge, of the justices who dissented in the Affordable Care Act case in 2010 said 
um, effectively that if the mandate was struck down that the whole law must go. Those, still, those four are still on the bench. The fifth is Kavanaugh. And it's unclear how he would vote in this Texas case should it be brought to the Supreme Court. I think, I think that he could pull a Justice, Chief Justice Roberts and save the bill because the reason I say that is because the majority of people are so supportive of protection, protections for those with pre-existing conditions. If the ACA is struck down, those go away. And Kavanaugh, if he is the fifth vote on the future of the ACA, on, on whether the whole thing has to go, I could see him saving the bill. If I'm wrong, then he would say, you're right, the whole thing has to go. Right. But if that were to happen, it would lead to chaos, because now you have divided the Congress, right? You can't pass a, re a replacement bill so quickly. I think it's a big problem. There are some other areas at stake as well next year um, and beyond. And I think, again, this goes to the chipping away of the ACA and sort of what happens if the administration orders um, sort of agencies to not enforce parts of the ACA, which is kind of already going down. And so part of that is, can the president effectively decline to enforce a law he finds unconstitutional? So if he can't find footing in the democratically controlled House, will he just say, hey, you know, IRS, stop enforcing the employer mandate, for example? Or can you simply say, hey, states, keep expanding short-term health plans and AHPs, which Ronald talked about. I mean, I would think this would be crazy to, to Trump to do this stuff, but that's would why be. he probably would But do he's it. testing the limits of, of presidential power, and one of the things that Kavanaugh is known for well, is an expansive view of presidential power. So we'll look, look at these five questions going forward. Um, will people, individual people who are covered by, say, the Medicaid expansion, will they be able to sue if the president and his administration tries to not enforce certain parts of the law? We'll have to wait and see. We'll be watching these things, but I expect the Supreme Court to take a big center stage next year on the ACA. Brady, go back to the White House. Have you know? Have uh, say hello to the cabinet for us, and uh, we'll talk to you next month. All right. right, Ron, we'll turn over to you. Let's not spend too much time on associate health plans. Definitely not. So I know that people pretty much know this. Yeah. If some of the people who are dialed in don't know what an AHP is. They probably should dial in, right? Yeah. We've talked a little bit about association health plans in the last couple of webinars. Uh, we did a podcast on the issue. Uh, I will say right now that one of the big changes, you know, again, when we heard about the fact that they were going to change the rules regarding association health plans, we were so certain that this was going to create all these new great opportunities. And we unfortunately saw how those opportunities were limited, uh, in particular by some of the things we'll talk about, the MIWA laws, the state laws that apply sort of limited those opportunities. I would actually say even now with the result of the elections, like Brady said, um, given the sort of split nature of Congress, if you're expecting any changes or revisions uh, to the rules that are already out there, you know, that's going to be a bit frozen. Uh, the I mean, at the end of the day, Ron, it's, yep. it's gonna, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to whether there's a way for self-funded plans to have an exemption, right? Us and the MIWA laws? 100%. With the old rules, you know, that was just a pipe dream because, again, you needed to not only be in the same geography, but in the same industry. So those rules were very limited. And then you were subject to the state law in which you're located because, again, same geography. You don't have to worry. It's that one state. You didn't really see people taking advantage of it. You do remember during the presidential campaign, there was a lot of talk about cross-border competition, right? We're going to let plans... Uh, co compete across state lines, right? You could purchase insurance across state lines. What that actually meant, nobody really knows. And I think that the association health plans was a great opportunity to at least try and deliver on that promise. Uh, and the way they did it was by eliminating the word and and instead changing it to the word or. So now you don't necessarily need to be in the same industry and same geography. You're in the same industry or same geography, meaning you could be in the same spot doing different business or same business, multiple states, there's your cross-state line competition. I want to ask you guys, I mean, do we think any of this is going to cause significant changes as it relates to the ability for our clients, our TPAs, our brokers to add new business? You know, it, great question, because I actually originally thought the answer was no. And because, for the very reason I just discussed, my main focus was on, oh, you could have an association health plan across state lines. Hopefully, like you said, Adam, and I know uh, SIA, for instance, the Government Relations Committee, we were working really hard to try and get some sort of federal preemption or exemption from right. state law for these MIWAs, I'm um, sorry, association health plans that cross state lines so you don't have to comply with every single state where you're located. Um, and we just didn't get that. So when I saw that happen, I thought, man, oh, man, nothing's going to happen. Association health plans are going to die. But what I actually feel now is the opportunity with association health plans is not the same industry across state lines, but rather multiple businesses within the same uh, geography. That's where I think the opportunity is going to be. So I would tell you that as we look at association health plans, focus on two things. One, 
if there are small to medium-sized employers who want to self-fund their benefit plan, they're in the same geography, they're not in the same industry, the opportunity exists in the association health plan rules to create an association health plan. The main issue, like I said, that we were having with association health plans was the need to comply with various state laws in all these different states. But if you're in the same geography, Adam, guess what? There's only one state law to comply with. Two, and this is something I've been thinking about, is not only do you only have to comply with that one state's law, and not only does this encourage small to medium-sized employers in the same geography to band together and self-fund, but Adam, this is also an opportunity to have some steerage, right? You start to combine all these small to medium-sized plans, now you start to have a large plan. If you're in the same geography, Adam, you can go to the, the local hospital, the providers in that area, and you can say, hey, individually, none of us were big enough to move the needle. But this plan now represents thousands of lives. Can we execute a direct contract with you? Can we get something done? Right. Now, all of a sudden, you can move the needle. That's where I think some of the opportunity exists. Now, that being said, again, efforts were going to be underway to try and reduce the number of state laws you need to comply with down to one state or even better, some sort of federal preemption. Um, but unfortunately, like I said, because of the split Congress, I don't expect any major changes to occur at this point. Now, what I see here is from a market impact, talking about 4 million Americans joining an associate health plan by 2023, younger lives, et cetera. They're switching from the, obviously, Obamacare, the ACA. Brady, is that something that you think could potentially happen here? Because if that's the case, sure, even if we don't, you know, get rid of the ACA, if more and more people leave it for other, other options, regardless of whether or not it's legal, if no one's in it from a marketplace perspective, it's like Blockbuster. No one has to make it illegal to buy a VHS tape, right? Right. So that's, you just, yeah. just go. That's what I mean when I say chipping away at the ACA, both you know from regulation, but also the market will do this because when you expand AHPs and short-term health plans and you allow more people to join them, they're fleeing the individual market, right? They're driving up the cost, leaving sicker people behind in the exchanges. Eventually, this will, I think even the president tweeted this, I'm sure he did, in fact, that the ACA will explode on its own or will implode on its own if nothing is done to fix it. So while it's, you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you won't, the, the Congress is going to have trouble passing a repeal and replace bill. But if they do nothing, if they don't stabilize the markets, it's also why I'll be watching. Uh, there, were, there were two senators, I believe Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray, I think, who tried to come up with, before uh, the elections, with a, a, a saving sort of safe face bill for the ACA's individual exchanges to stabilize them because you have people fleeing for other various forms of insurance, including AHPs and now short-term plans, and they're concerned that Obamacare itself, the viability will just be unsustainable. It already sort of is with looking at the premium increases year after year. So, so Ron, I'd be interested to see, from a state standpoint, you know, what states actually pressure their legislators to actually make changes to the VWAL regulations to allow for an expansion of the AHP to include self-funding as being exempt from VWAL laws. I mean, I think that's that's a key thing here, right? Yeah. Well, look at it this way. Again, if I'm a state, right, and I want to attract some business to my to my state, I can tell yet again, in addition to taxes and other things, I can now say, we welcome employers who want to band together and form association health plans. Look at all these happy employers in the state of fill in the blank and the plan that they came together and, and created, and they're working hand in hand with our local hospitals to fix health care. That's a nice sell to an employer who wants to move their business. Now we're going to switch it back over to Brady. There's a bunch of different rules we want to focus on for 2019. We're going to try to speed things through, speed these through in the next 15 to 20 minutes that we have. But the first one is the wellness program incentive rules, which basically is telling us there are no rules, right. there are no guidelines, therefore, uh, yeah, yeah. But what, just try, try your best? So this will be an easy one because there's no rules to describe yet. So there's some brief background here. I know we, this also came up, uh, I think, last month's webinar and in a few podcasts we've done. But what's going on here, this is a case where um, – the federal court uh, ordered, essentially, the Equal Opportunity and Oppor uh, Commission, the EEOC, to rewrite its definition of voluntary to more uh, to align better with the dictionary definition. The, the thinking there is that um, what is the threshold percentage that an employer can offer in terms of incentives to an employee before their incentive program is deemed to be compulsory and not voluntary? Uh, previously, the 30% was the rule meaning uh, you know, the, the incentive could not be more than it cost an employee to obtain coverage um, on their own. Uh, but that wasn't well-defined enough for the federal court. And so they ordered the EEOC to rewrite the definition of voluntary. Um, they also ordered them to do this and leave enough time for employers to incorporate these new limits for incentives into their own wellness programs, starting in 1119. Now, that's not going to happen because the EEOC has a staffing problem. 
There is no chair of the EEOC. There's a number of vacancies that need to be uh, filled, hasn't been done. So the EEOC is not going to comply with it. They're going to fail to meet this court order to get the, the rules redefined here. But we're talking about here wellness programs um, that implicate the ADA or GINA, not about not general ADA or, or, uh, or HIPAA. Well, those are, they have their own rules for those. But we'll be watching to see if they get their stuff together, frankly, and pass the new rules and write them. And if they do, we'll bring them to you. But the uh, reality is we don't expect anything to happen not, anytime right, soon. So too. basically, people can ask, so what do we do? Be reasonable. Right. Exactly. Yeah, we have. We, we can. If you ask, we have an answer for you. The, the answer essentially is keep doing what you're doing now. You're not going to be held accountable for the fact that there's no new rules being issued. Right. Um, but we expect it to happen in the coming months when positions get filled at the EEOC and they can actually write the rules. You think yeah. of applying for the job there, Brady? You're going to be the chairman of the. Uh, I may have EEOC? already submitted an application. I got you. In that case, it'll get done. It'll get done fast. Well, yeah. thankfully, Brady can't leave our company because we'll show all the special photos we have of him online. That's so, right. Oh, that's right. how we get to keep it. Wow. Wow. Politics, Brady. But Brady, what we do want to talk about is something that is a major, major issue here for our clients, especially for, you know, our own DPC doctor, Dr. Tremblay, who we work with in Holbrook. The fact that, you know, even though we may not all love HSAs for a variety of reasons, right? Some people do, some people don't. There's an argument back and forth. But it's a big deal now that in a DPC arrangement, me as a member, as an employee, I can use funds from my HSA account to pay for the monthly bill that I'll get for my DPC doctor. Right. And just in case anybody's listening that they don't know what DPC is, we're talking direct primary care. This is where a physician chooses to sort of divorce themselves. Ron, our the people are system. educated. You would think our so, people you know, know this stuff. Listen, I just Everyone want to make sure what DPC I'm just trying to show off how much I know, right? And uh, they basically charge a capitated sort of subscription fee to the plan or to the employer, depending on how it's structured. And in essence, that gives you unlimited access to that provider, which has, for us, been awesome. So, Fred, you want to get into the details? Yeah. So, I mean, this is about enhancing the use of health savings accounts. Right. This is a popular bipartisan issue. That's why it passed the House 277 to 142. That's a big margin these days. Uh, basically, what happened here is... This bill would double the allowable contribution amounts to your HSA if it were to become law. Um, it would basically also um, expand the definition of qualified medical expenses. So you can include things like sports and fitness programs, gym memberships. Um, again, DPC, that's a huge thing. It would also allow employers to have on-site medical clinics and other health services without risking your HSA eligibility. Anyone who's operating a plan, an HSA plan, knows that if you're not complying with the rules, you can lose your status as an HSA. That's a big deal, obviously. Uh, so this House bill is about really trying to loosen the rules surrounding what you can contribute, you plus your spouse, or, or allowing more things to qualify as medical expenses. But again, this has just passed so far one chamber of Congress. It's got to have a Senate counterpart that passes. So let's get back to your futurist code. <laughs> what will happen in Congress? I think this is an easy one, too. I think this, along with bipartisan drug pricing reform, I think this will get done early next year. Uh, barring some catastrophe. One of the cool that things that people are notice on the slide is that it's allowing when they see a cap. Typically, we see caps that are low. $150 per individual for a monthly DPC fee is that's really high. That is high. That's a so cover. you know that's not you know there is no DPC doctor that's saying, oh well, I can't do this for 150. I mean, we typically see it capped out around 100. Yeah. yeah so right. you know even a $300 per family is pretty high. So. This is good news for those doctors. And real quick, the reason why, I mean, people say, well, is that high, really? The doctors don't have to deal with administrative staff, right? They're getting paid, generally speaking. They don't have all this red tape that they have currently. Because they're not sending in bills. Exactly. Right. So this is good, I think, all around for everyone. They're trying to find ways to do coding to get higher reimbursements. I mean, right. yep. they're spending their time taking care of patients. Which is what they should be, yep. Well, I want to make sure I give a shout out to Dr. Tremblay, who I think I preferred my Uncle Derek as a patient to him. Good luck with that, Dr. Tremblay, but, you know... <laughs> All right, sir. Money's money. 150 ahead. So we're going to go back to John, who's on a little hibernation there for a while. John, let's talk about another big issue. Again, this is where, again, sorry for selling ourselves, where FIA's gap program comes in, the paid family medical leave, what the laws are per state versus what your own employee handbook and or uh, employee benefit plan might have to say about it. Go ahead. Thanks, Adam. So uh, as many of you know, and as Adam just alluded to, a lot of states – have their own laws about paid family or medical leave. And uh, just to highlight one in particular, Massachusetts recently passed a law that provides 26 or more weeks of paid family or medical leave per year. Now, that is a lot of weeks. That is half the year or more. So the reason that these become relevant to our business and, and to your lives are for three primary reasons based on our experience. One is stop loss gaps. Gaps in coverage can occur between employee handbooks and plan documents. 
and stop loss policies and administrative services agreements even. So that's something to look out for. If, if you've got an employer that is subject to a federal or state law regarding paid family or medical leave, which by the way happens to be uh, just about all employers, <laughs> there are certain exceptions, but uh, it's a concern for almost everyone. If you've got an employer like that, matching that description, make sure you check the handbook and check the plan doc and check the stop loss policy and make sure there aren't going to be any gaps because this is an area not like usual and customary, not like anything else. This is where the plan covers claims and the stop loss policy might say, no way. This patient is not even covered. I can't believe that we have 26 weeks of paid leave. Isn't that great? It's unbelievable. Why do you guys think it's great? For employees, it's great. Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm an employee now, too. I forgot about that. Okay. So, yes, it is great. Fabulous. But, again, this is, I mean, I'm assuming in every state it's different. So, this is, I'm assuming we're very, you know, we have much more time off for our employees than a typical state would. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Real, real quick, too. The reason this is happening at the state level is because there's no federal paid family leave law. That's why this is happening state by state. Right. And really quickly, just to finish up this slide. The question of ERISA preemption always comes into play because the state laws tend to be worded not quite clearly because when they're wording the laws, some govern insurance, some are considered to govern employers. As you may know, if it governs insurance, it may well be preempted by ERISA. And if it governs employers, it's probably not preempted by ERISA. So I want to make sure I take the time on this one really quickly, folks. If you have not updated your ASA, now is the time to do it. I know you're going through renewals. You're doing it now. It's the, it's the middle of November. Please send over your ASA to us. This is not an expensive proposition. We have new ASA language out there, new ASA, ASA protections. How you handle your claims and appeals has changed. Who places the stop loss has changed. It used to be just the TPA. Now more brokers are having that language in, the, in your a, ASA. Basically, it's the service agreement for your entire operation with all of your clients. You need to make sure that you protect yourself as it relates to those two things, network disputes, how you handle overpayments, who's responsible for them, the right for you to actually collect on that overpayment before you owe that money to the actual employer group, and then looking at percentage of savings fees versus PPM fees. As more and more organizations in our industry are merging or being acquired, most of these acquiring entities like the reoccurring revenue stream from a PPM basis. Therefore, as more and more TPAs start looking at, let's be honest, selling, or you know, even maybe a little piece of private equity money in their organization, some are looking at ways to look at more PPM opportunities for their organization. So what I would say to you is, even though your services you may be offering to your clients hasn't changed, the expectations by consultants, brokers, and your employee groups definitely has. That's for sure. Anybody want to throw anything else on this slide before I'm done? Just to add that, you know, the number of disputes that we see, too, involving ASAs are unique. They're changing all the time. So if things that we're looking for in these reviews also gets updated. So, you know, send them to us. We're happy to review them. And so everyone knows, all the slides will be available within an hour after this particular podcast, after this webinar is over. Roger, what's something to add there? Well, yeah, no, I was just going to say, in addition to just the legal requirements or the stories and things you're trying to address in the ASA, the last thing to note the ASA is between you and the plan sponsor. In case you didn't know, the types of employers that are sponsoring self-funded plans has changed and the things they value have changed. The ASAs you have were written between you and large employers 20 years ago to address the things they care about. Chances are your new clients, these new employers who are small, medium, don't necessarily know what they're getting into, their requirements and what they value are completely different. So that ASA has got to change. Great point, Ron. John, back to you on plan design. Thanks. So I'll, I'll blow through this, and I know that if Jen McCormick were here, um, she would have a lot more to say on this. But in the interest of time, uh, basically, when you're looking at your SPD, you have to make sure it's compliant. I think that that goes without saying, or I, I would hope that that went without saying, except that we see things all the time here in our consulting and plan drafting division that are just nightmare. So for one thing, is it amended and restated correctly? If it's scribbled on a napkin, it's probably not correct. You would be amazed at the things that we've seen here. But basically, if you're looking at an amendment or a restatement, make sure you're doing it right. You can contact us, of course, at pjcreferralfbagroup.com because we've got a whole big team of plan drafting experts that can make sure what you're doing is correct or do it for you. And treating classes of employees equally. This actually goes back to what I was saying about the highly compensated individual and um, the uh, executive benefit plans. But basically, if you have a group of individuals that have that, that are not 
different in terms of bona fide employment-based classifications. You have to treat them equally. One of the things I noticed about this slide, if you think about it, this entire, all this focuses on, focuses on one big thing, equality, equi equitable, non-discriminatory. Everything's about being fair. Yeah. And that's what we're noticing a lot more lawsuits in regards to just being not, you know, not treating all employees the same or fairly or yeah. the same process. So if you notice, a lot of the stuff we're talking about here goes right back to the slides we talk about in regards to the ASA that's right. of you need to be compliant and this is why, and here's how to protect yourself from any type of dispute with your client. Yeah, in society as well as the health benefit industry, things have migrated to a culture of fairness, like you said, Adam. Right. And it's, it's kind of like everybody is crying, what about me? You know, I, I, wanna, I want these same benefits. I want to be treated this exact same way. And ERISA and HIPAA sometimes allow you to treat people differently, but other times they don't. And you can bet that when plan members contact attorneys and saying, I'm being treated unfairly, there's always going to be an attorney who wants to jump on that because they know that it's easy pickings. As we see audits going up, and the reason why audits are going up is because claim charges are getting higher. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me, charges are getting higher. People feel they need to audit more. You audit more, you start denying more pieces. Now you're denying. Why are you denying? I'm going to appeal. And then you get into this whole issue of compliance. So the first thing you're looking at is, all right, you want to deny this claim? Let me look at that SPD. Let me look at that employee handbook to make sure you can't. And if there's anything ambiguous in there, we're going to find a way to beat you down. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody's looking to contain costs. When you're paying everything, nobody complains. When you start to tighten the right. belt and look at what you're doing, contain costs, people are going to find opportunities. Yeah, let me to come do this quickly in regards to what you want to compare your SPD to, if you don't mind just doing that quick. Sure. Uh, basically, when you're looking at an SPD, you want to compare it to the handbook, the stop loss policy, the administrative services agreement, any other ancillary documents, basically anything that could conceivably or does impact the benefits in any way, either whether it's uh, health benefits or stop loss benefits, you want to make sure that there are no gaps between the SPD and those documents. So when you're looking at amendments, if you've got 10 amendments, you'd better be sure that you need to compare each one of those 10 amendments against all those documents because amendments change the plan. And if you're comparing an old version of the plan against the stop loss policy, it's not current. By definition, the plan has been amended. You need to look at all the relevant documents, every single document. And if you've got 30 documents, I'm sorry, but you've got to look at them all. And uh, cost containment obviously is a huge factor in a plan document. I think we've touched on that on probably every webinar in FIA's history. Cost containment's huge. If you don't have good cost containment, you don't have good protection against cost. But I think the thing we need to focus on is tied in there in the incentive piece, and we're going to talk about it here. And I really want to spend a couple minutes on this. That's why I want to blow through the last one, is that in order to, to really drive patient engagement, you have to change the culture in your organization. And the hard part, the easy part is putting the stuff in your plan doc, in your employee handbook. The hard part is how do people remember it? Now, this is what I always tell people. What we've tried to do is change the tools that our employees use. Let me give you an example. I used to think that everything revolves around emails. Like we need to get everyone's email addresses and email them. And then I realized, you know, people were talking about apps. And then people started talking about portals. There are so many apps and portals out there. I mean, I have some clients who have portals for their own portals, where you literally have to go into five different things. No one wants to do that. And then it hit me one day, I think Ron and I, I don't know if it was Ron, but I think it was, we're at an airport and I got a push notification to my phone telling me that my gate had changed. Right. And I said to myself, wow, I, you don't even have to go to the screen anymore. Like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to the website at American Airlines. I'm being told by American via my cell phone that through a text that the gates changed. And that's really how we can give tools to our employees and dependents on how to lower the overall cost of care, how to incentivize them by literally pushing this information, these notifications to their phone. And that's why we realized, all right, how many, what percentage of our clients actually have their cell phone numbers in their claim systems? And here's the problem, folks. 15% of you actually keep track of the cell phone numbers for your employees and their dependents. Therefore, imagine how much easier it would be if a patient went into a doctor's office and got a script. If right away they can get a push button, push notification to their phone saying, oh, by the way, that drug that you want to, you're about to buy at CVS or Walgreens, you can buy that drug online, have no copay, and we're going to give you 20% of the savings. Click here and have that drug delivered to your home. 
instead of mailing EOBs. This is the future. This is what I see for 2019, and I want to make sure we talk about some of the incentives that John's going to focus on here really quickly in the next two minutes. All this stuff can be notified through an employee's phone to engage them right then and there not after they've already been treated. John? So let's blow through these. The first two have to do with hospitals. The first one, of course, is emergency services. If you can incentivize members to go to urgent care over an emergency room, that's a ton of savings, just unbelievable savings right there. Second one is, uh, well, just hospital facilities. If you can incentivize members to go to non-hospital facilities like ambulatory surgical centers, a lot of savings there, probably not quite as much as the difference between ERs and uh, urgent care centers, but still great savings there. Generic prescription drugs. If you can eliminate copays in exchange for getting generic drugs, that's fantastic. That is something that a lot of members will take advantage of because, frankly, they've got no reason not to and every reason to. Claim audit and reviewing. One of the things that we have said uh, pretty much forever, and I think that Adam uh, coined this concept, is that nobody is better at reviewing his or her own bill than the patient. When the plan gets a bill, the plan has really no way to know whether a service was actually performed. But the patient can look at a bill and say, what is this? I didn't have my arm removed. This is nuts. And if you give patients a percent of the savings, well, that's an incentive to really stay home on a Friday night and look at their bills. Hey, you know, this last one on Skin of the Game, just so you know, that, that price that I have there from Amazon of 118 I just looked at it, at it again. It's gone down to like 40 bucks. So, you know, just because you're getting 30% off at Blue Cross Blue Shield, you might be better off paying 100% of the bill on Amazon.com. And not, not, not right, yeah. for in two days if you have Prime. There you go. So with that, let's go right to the next one. Ron, last right. slide before we're done. So this is one we're actually famous for, but at the same time, I also want to issue a word of warning, Adam. I know this seems like only positivity, but I'm going to inject some classic Ron negativity into it as well. Uh, we're known in the industry, or at least Adam is known in the industry, as the diaper man because of this story. The fact that we identify the facilities that have the highest quality scores, but at the same time, the lowest cost to deliver babies. Why did we spend so much time identifying these areas, these uh, centers of excellence? And literally, we incentivize new, new parents in our plan to, uh, to actually go to one of these centers of excellence and deliver their baby there. Why did we do that? Because we have so many employees that are uh, female, childbearing age, new parents. The problem is Adam goes to a conference, he tells this story. There are people in the crowd, they say, I love that idea. They take it, they copy paste it into their plan. That plan has no women of childbearing age and they're so proud of themselves. Guys, it's just an example. You need to find what's driving costs for your plan and figure out how to address those costs that are specific to your plan. Adam? So, you're saying is, unless if you don't hire any women, now you're being discriminatory. I think you've got bigger issues. If you don't hire any women in your organization, well, there you go. If you don't have any well, childbirth uh, claims, maybe you should do some self-reflection. Well, there's other things that can find ways to save money. Absolutely. Folks, that's all the time we have for today. We appreciate all the questions, all the great feedback. We look forward to seeing you all December 12th. That's after Thanksgiving, after Black Friday. Or but two. still way before I do any shopping at all for Christmas for my family. Wish us luck. See us next month, December 12th at 1 o'clock for part two. We might end up having a three-part. We might do a third part in January. That'd be fun. But we'll see you all next month. On behalf of Brady, John, Ron, and myself, thank you so much for empowering your plans with the Fia Group. Have a great day.